morning, New Hope, for everybody in here, out there, watching us online, in the lobby for your parking lot. Come on in. We're going to stand this morning as we make a joyful noise. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way, let mercy come in. That's when death was arrested, my life began. was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, we sing, oh, your grace. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. That's when death was arrested and my life became. For your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down.
Father, we thank you for giving us that freedom. Uh, from the very moment we accept you into our heart, we thank you that we are free from the bounds and laws of sin and death, that we are one with you. And I thank you for this morning, giving us this place where we can come and lift our voices and hearts and hands to you. And I pray that it would be an awesome time of worship, meeting you here, knowing that you want to meet us here. So no matter the week that we face, the week that's ahead, I thank you that we can just push the pause button on life for, if only for a few minutes, just to focus on you and let you speak to us in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, New Hope. Good morning. morning. All right, everyone. This is the last week for Operation Christmas Child, so we have boxes on both sides to grab. We set the bar really, really high this year. A little bit on accident, but it's exciting too because we found extra boxes. So 250 is our goal. We have some, both sides are empty. So please grab some extras if you can this week. These boxes are going around the world to kids in need, kids that don't always get the message of the gospel. They are able to send these to countries that do not have access to missionaries, the Bible, things like that. This is a little way to get it to them. And so please support this cause. There is the information packets on the sign-up desk out there and the entry desk over there, and it also gives you the label for how to pay for the shipping and how to send it in, the different things you're able to put in the box, and a couple things they'd rather you not um, for safety or shipping issues. So go ahead and grab some more boxes. They are due next week, if at all possible. Just make sure you bring them in and put them by the sign-up desk in the fellowship hall. Um, this week we have this Friday, Saturday, sorry, we have our paint night that is a little bit of a fundraiser to get some new Christmas decorations for the church, some coordinating things, some things we can take to the new building when we get that up. It is at 6 p.m. on Saturday. It is $20 per person, and there's a way to sign up for that in the app. There are only, I think, 16 spots, 15 spots available now. So please be sure to sign up today. Next week, we have our Discovering Ministry class. There's a maturity class. I apologize. Too many M's around here. Whose fault is that? <laughs> All right. So, Discovering Maturity. So, last month, we did mis- uh, Discovering Ministry, where we found out uh, the special <laughs> talents that God has given, not even talents, but special gifts from the Spirit that God has given us to be able to use for His kingdom to support the churches, to um, reach out to others. This week, or this month, Next week on the 14th, right at noon, in the kids' building, we're going to have lunch, and we're going to dive into what does it mean to be a mature Christian, and how do we get there, because that's always the biggest question. Um, It goes for around hour and a half, two hours if we like to talk, which we tend to. (laughs) Jesse? All right, but we're just going to dive into what that means and how to get there, and I think that this is a hugely important thing to figure out. I was called a baby Christian for a while there, and I honestly didn't like it or understand it. This is a great way to understand why you're called that and how to get past that and to grow in Christ and in fellowship with fellow Christians. Um, Next, on November 21st, we have our family feast that is going to be immediately after service. This is one of New Hope's big traditions where you come in, the chairs will be gone, not totally gone, but gone, and there's going to be tables set up with chairs around it, and we're going to sit family style during sermon, and then immediately after sermon, we're going to go try a whole bunch of different chilies, which some slots for chili entries have opened up, and we also need some desserts, possibly sides, to go with it, and there is a sign-up on the sign-up table out there, so if you know you have a rock and chili and want to earn a prize, please go sign up or please bring some desserts and make sure we know that you're bringing it so we know how many extra to grab. Um, That is November 21st, and the cutoff for sign-ups will be next Sunday because we do want to make sure we have impartial judges available. So make sure you sign up if you want to do chili, especially before next Sunday or on next Sunday. It will be the cutoff. Um, Last but not least, we have some friends of New Hope that are near and dear to our hearts that are doing something really, really cool to reach out to this neighborhood and beyond, all of Cochise County, actually, by offering after-school programs. This is one of the ministries that New Hope supports um, monthly, actually, but we they also want to let you know what's going on and what um, other ways they need support. So we're going to bring up Bill Mishler for just a second.
Jessica, say, wasn't Sunday night awesome? You know, we had a booth and we gave out necklaces with the colored beads that tells the gospel. We estimate we gave out close to 200. Isn't that awesome? What a mission out of that. But now we're going to show a video that basically tells the story of what Good News Clubs are all about. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He's already formed his beliefs. His heart is hard. He no longer believes God is good. He's not alone. You can share the gospel with them, and you should. But according to George Barna, what you believe by the time you are 13 is what you will die believing. After the age of 19, someone's probability of accepting Christ drops to just 6%, leaving John on a path to a Christless eternity. How do you change his future? Let's go back in time to when John was a child. He never went to church. His mom doesn't trust them. So let's find his public school and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. His mother sees the change in his life. When he asks to go to church, she comes too, and she comes to Christ. And it all began in a public school good news club. But where did that club come from? Let's go back in time again. This is Jane's second year with Child Evangelism Fellowship. See, I've trained her, created the materials to equip her and her team as they teach, and helps her raise support to work with children full time. Jane is not alone. Her church partners with CEF to host and staff Good News Clubs in two other schools. And around the world, hundreds of thousands of Christians do the same, evangelizing children, discipling them and establishing them in local churches. As God transforms children's lives in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and around the world, making the appointments and adjustments to bring the right person into the right life at the right time. Some he calls his children, some as adults, but for each he changes the line of their lives forever, threading them into a beautiful tapestry. This is his work, but he invites us to be his agents, to join him in taking the gospel to every child, every nation, every day, because today, is someone's future. And this is how you change the future. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, then like and subscribe to our channel for more. Don't forget to check out our other videos. You know, that video is not far-fetched. That's already happened here at PDS this year. And uh, a, a, a young girl and her mother are now going to church every, every day, every Sunday. So anyway, last year was really rough on uh, child evangelism. Good News Clubs, all the schools were closed to us. We had three Good News Clubs. One was over in Bisbee, one was at Shiloh, and one was here. The Bisbee Club had about five. Uh, Shiloh had one student. We had five workers and one student. And someone said, isn't that kind of a waste? And yet you stop and you think, what if that one student was a Spurgeon or a Dwight L. Moody or Pastor Dennis or Pastor Jesse? We don't know who that one student is going to turn out. But we had about eight students here, and three of those boys accepted Christ. So uh, that's what it's all about. So anyway, next Saturday, we're going to be having a class here. It's six hours. It's no cost. You're under no obligation to work with child evangelism. We just pray that you will get involved and like uh, uh, maybe teach Sunday school here. That's fine. We would love that or even help with good news clubs. But anyway, the schools are opening up. We're looking at uh, next month. We're in three right now and one next month and maybe five or six by the first of the year. So please pray for child evangelism. And if you can come Saturday, let us know so we can plan lunch for you. Thank you.
Awesome. So we'll return to worship. And as we do that, as always, feel free to sit or stand, whatever you're comfortable doing this morning.
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior of that cursed
the name of the Lord of come to you this morning and we worship you. We worship you in song. We worship you in spirit. We worship you with our words, but most importantly, we come to worship you with our hearts. But Lord, we also recognize that we are very inept, very <laughs> uh, dirty on the inside with our hearts that are corrupted by sin. And worshiping you with our heart is not e an easy thing to do all the time. But Lord, you put in us your love. You put in us the ability to reflect your love back at you with our worship and with, with our minds and our soul and our every being. And we, that's what we intend to do this morning. But Lord, we also know that in order for that to happen, we have to surrender our heart to you. We have to surrender our will and our desires and, and those selfish things that drive us from day to day. We have to just leave it at the cross and hand it over to you so that you can be the molder, so that you can mold this clay that we are, so that you can change us from the inside. Because that's why we come here, Lord. That's why we listen to your word being preached. That's why we come to let you change us. But I know that we are hard-hearted. We are stubborn. We are distracted. So, Lord, we ask you this morning to soften our hearts and to prepare us to be changed by your word, by your power. And not just us, Lord, but the children. We just, we just saw this, this video about 
children needing to hear your word, and it starts here, and they are then taking it to their friends, and it, it starts with a heart that's willing to go and be used. And Lord, for some of us, we aren't too good with kids. <laughs> but Lord, we can help those who are. Lord, this morning, we know that there are churches everywhere. There are your children. There are your men and women and, and kids and, and your senior citizens out there who just love you. And they have come to worship you. And again this morning, Lord, we recognize that sometimes hearing your word is looking in a mirror and seeing the sins that are in our heart and admitting that they're there. And that's not an easy thing to do for anybody, no matter how long they've been a Christian. So this morning, we lift up our hearts to you so that they can be changed. Give Pastor Jesse the words Give them, him the words that you want us to hear. Take our mind and our thoughts and guide them towards you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you will do in our lives. Not just this morning, but for the rest of the week and for the rest of the month, for the rest of the year, and God willing, for the rest of this rest of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 to 14. Starting in chapter 5, Paul writes, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. And for this reason, I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up, not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, as always, it's a huge blessing to uh, to uh, come up here and, and, and deliver the word to you guys for this morning. Um, last week, oh, thank you very much. There we go. So last week, we went through the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, right? And in, the, in our survey of the book, of 1 Corinthians, we covered some of the history about the city of Corinth. We talked about some of the moral issues that were going on in the city uh, at the time, and, and which unfortunately ended up kind of invading uh, the church at Corinth as well. And um, the church, what we, what we found out was that the church of Corinth at the time that Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, which was around 
uh, the, the later half of 55 AD, uh, it was in a really bad place. The church was in a bad place. It was divided. Um, there was disunity. Uh, people were living, actively living li- uh, sexually immoral lives. Um, and, and the biggest problem was that they were bringing all of that into their worship of God. And, 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 and what I pointed out is that, right, we've been doing this survey through the entire Bible. And one of the things that we learned in the Old Testament is that we can bring what's called unworthy worship to God. And he, do, he doesn't want that worship. In fact, not only does he not want it, but he rejects it. And so this worship that the Corinthians were bringing to God, we can only assume, based on what we know from the Old Testament about God is that their worship was being rejected. They were coming, bringing their sexual immorality. They were come in, coming in their disunity. And their, Paul even says that their meetings were, did more harm than they ever did any good. So after writing this letter the, that, that we call 1 Corinthians, Paul sent Timothy to go check up on how the Corinthians had reacted, how they received this letter, only for Timothy to return um, and report that that matters in Corinth were actually worse off uh, than they were before. Matters had only become more complicated due to the arrival of, of these false apostles who began to assault the character, the message, and the apostleship of Paul. Um... And they, they did all this in order to build a platform from them, for themselves to, to preach a false gospel to the Corinthians. Uh, they, they did so that they could, to, could come in and, and twist uh, the, the Corinthians' understanding of the message that Paul gave them, the message of the gospel. And when Paul received this news from Timothy, he was uh, very sad, very grieved, in fact, so much that, that, that he, he was in the middle of a missionary trip to the city of Ephesus, and he literally just stopped what he was doing and went to Corinth to go and address the issue face-to-face with these Corinthians. Um, and unfortunately, that visit didn't go well either. Uh, Paul describes it in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians verse 1 as a painful visit. He describes it as a painful visit. In fact, things got so out of control that one of the Corinthians, in public, during a service, during while Paul was 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 speaking, openly and publicly insulted him. That's the point that that the church in Corinth had come to. And seeing that this visit wasn't uh, doing any good. Um, and in hopes that really time would hopefully turn the Corinthians back to the true gospel, Paul decided it's, it, was, it was best to leave the city of Corinth, and, and he went back and returned to the city of Ephesus where he continued his ministry that he was working on there uh, before he left to go uh, approach the, uh, uh, um, confront the Corinthians. And not long after he returned to Ephesus, Paul once again wrote another letter to the Corinthians, and this time, this letter, uh, it actually became known, as, is known now as the severe letter, and unfortunately, a, a copy of this letter has never been recovered. We don't actually have a copy of this severe letter, but he sent Titus with this letter to Corinth, and Paul, he was, he was so distraught over uh, his last visit with the Corinthians, and he sent this letter with Titus, and he was he had so much angst about finding out, man, how did the Corinthians take this, this letter that I just sent to them? I hope that it's building up, right? Just like Paul said in the, in the chapter or in the, in the section of Scripture there that we just had Brent read, right? He wanted to exercise this authority that he had as an apostle in order to build up. And so that's what he was hoping for, and he was anxious about this. And so in his angst, in his excitement to see how the Corinthians received this severe letter, Paul goes and he meets Titus at the halfway mark. Not the halfway mark as the crow flies, but the actual, how the road goes, the halfway mark, in a city called Macedonia, where he he received 
finally received word from Titus that the majority of the Corinthians had repented and that they were turning back to the gospel that Paul originally brought to them. They were turning back to the truth. And so Paul, at this, at this time, there were still these embers of rebellion within, within the Corinthian church. Most of them had, had turned back to the Lord and turned away from, from what they were doing, but Paul, not wanting to stir up those embers of rebellion that were still fading, decided it's, it's probably not a good time to go visit but I'm going to write another letter. And that's the letter that we call today, the letter that we're going to be going through here, the letter uh, of 2 Corinthians. Uh, And so 2 Corinthians, um, it's it's an interesting letter, right? It's an interesting letter. It's a very complicated uh, letter uh, in that uh, the theme is, is, it's kind of difficult to find. Uh, it's not as easy as the theme of other, uh, other, other epistles, right? And, and while the theme of, of the book of 1 Corinthians uh, was pretty much surrounded the condition of the people in, Co- in the church of Corinth, the theme of 2 Corinthians focused on the condition of the ministry, the condition of the ministry at Corinth, dealing specifically in three different areas in the ministry at Corinth. Uh, the first of which, the first of, uh, of these three areas of the ministry that, that Paul goes into is that of Christian living, the, 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 the area of Christian living. And, and I think that in Paul's joy of hearing this news, he spends over half of this letter, the first seven out of 13 chapters, of course, chapters were added, added later, but, but as we see it today, he spends the first seven chapters addressing Christian living, but he does so in light of God's comfort. He does so in light of God's comfort. In each of these seven chapters, uh, the first seven chapters of 2 Corinthians covers God's comfort in seven different areas of Christian living, the first of which is chapter 1. Uh, God, he, he, he writes about God's comfort just in life. How God comforts us just in life. He writes this short uh, opening, this short introduction. And Again, I don't know how much you guys have read from Paul, but typically his introductions, some of them are shorter, some of them are longer, but I think this is the shortest introduction that Paul does. He, he, he writes his introduction in two letters. He's like, hey guys, it's Paul again. Blessings to you. Here we go. <laughs> right? He, he really gets right into it. And I think that that expresses his angst, his anxiety, his, his desire to want to get this letter to the Corinthians to tell them how happy and joyed and overwhelmed with joy that he was about hearing of their, of their, uh, um, hearing about their, 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 their repentance. And so he writes this short introduction, and then he says right there in verse 3, verses 3 through 7, the book of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, turn there if you have your Bibles, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we, uh, we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we have, that we, that, that, that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our suffering, You also share in our comfort. What sticks out to you guys about that? (laughs) I'll tell you what sticks out to me is that in four sentences, right, we have five verses here, but it's really, you break it down, it's four sentences. How many times does Paul say the word comfort? Ten times in four sentences. He says comfort four, or ten times in four sentences, Not only that, but he points out that God, the Father, is not only the Father of our Lord, but he's also the Father, he's the God of comfort. He is the God, he is the Father of mercy and comfort. 
And being the creator of comfort, it's he who comforts us, specifically in times of affliction. But for what reason? For what reason does he comfort us? He comforts us so that we can comfort. But who is it that we comfort? Paul says, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. He continues in verse 5 to say that if we share in Christ's suffering, remember, Jesus said, what did he say? They'll hate you, but who did they hate first? Him. They hated Jesus first. And so if we suffer hatred because of Christ, then we will also be comforted by God because of Christ. In fact, verse 6, he says that we are, we, we are afflicted so that we can be comforted. It's a change of mindset that we have to have. It's a change of mindset that we have to go through. We're not comforted because of our affliction. Rather, we are afflicted because of what we're comforted with. We're afflicted because of our comfort in Salvation through Christ Jesus. Moving on to chapter 2, the second, uh, the second way that God comforts us, the, way, the second way that he comforts us in Christian living is, is how he comforts us through the restoration of the sinning saint. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5-8 through eight says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. So many, many, including myself, uh, actually believe that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul instructs the Corinthians to purge the sexually immoral person from among them, uh, of course you guys remember that, we talked about that last week, that he was actually thinking of a specific person or, or maybe even a group of people. And it's thought that, the, that Paul is talking about the same person right here. In chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses, well, really the whole chapter. And we can assume, based on verse 7 in chapter 2, that this individual felt the weight of his sin, or that these people that he had in mind felt the weight of their sin. Because they were basically kicked out. They were excommunicated. The goal was to make him feel sorrowful sorrowful for his sexual immorality. And so Paul tells them to forgive him and to welcome him back so that he doesn't become overwhelmed with sorrow. He says, "Don't, don't let him become overwhelmed with too much sorrow for what he did. Verse 7, Paul gives them instruction to forgive and to comfort this man. So they're supposed to purge with him so that he can learn a lesson. And then when he feels that godly sorrow, they're supposed to bring him back and do what? Comfort him and minister to him. Give him the comfort that we also receive from our Father of comfort. In chapter 3, moving right along, God, it's, 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 it's writing about God's comfort in the ministry of Christ. And it's here in this chapter that Paul gives an outstanding, in my opinion, and powerful exposition of the nature of the New Testament, the New Covenant, compared to the nature of the Old Covenant. Specifically in verses 4 through 16, but but what I love about this section of Scripture here is that it is, I would say, outside of the book of Hebrews, probably one of the best explanations of the new covenant of the nature of the new covenant and and this is what paul says in chapter 3 verses 4 through 16 he says such is the confidence that we have through through christ toward god that we are that we are sufficient that we are sorry not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us 
but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness uh, must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case... What once had glory has come to, to, uh, to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpassed it. Excuse me, that surpasses it. For if what, is, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites not, might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So for those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with with what Paul's talking about here in the Old Testament, in short, uh, Moses asked to see the glory of God, and God told Moses no, because anyone who, who looks and sees the full glory of God will die. And so God allowed Moses to see the afterglow, And just seeing the tail end of what was left behind after God's presence left, Moses' face would glow. And the Israelites, they were astonished by this. It was amazing. But Moses started to notice that, that this glow was fading. And so to hide that fading from the Israelites, to keep them from seeing that the glow was fading, fading from his face, he would cover his face with a veil. And that's what, that's what Paul's making reference to here. He's talking about how temporary the Old Covenant was. Even the sacrifices made for sin in the Old Covenant were temporary. Everything about the Old Covenant was temporary. Nothing was permanent. The Old Covenant was only intended to stand for a time, in a short time, thankfully, whereas the New Covenant is intended to be permanent. But the problem was that Paul is talking about here is that their, 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 the, the hardness of their hearts and their minds, it's put them in, a, in, in the same position that really they've always been in where they can't understand either the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Old Covenant or the New Covenant. They can't understand it. There's a veil blocking them from seeing. The problem is, just like Moses hid the glory of the glow of his face from them, the glory of the New Covenant is also hidden and cannot be revealed unless the veil is removed. And there's only one way there's only one way to remove the veil and to, and to reveal the eternal glory of the new covenant. And that way is to seek after God. Paul says in verse 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. You see, guys, the only way, the only way is Jesus. Jesus is the way. And he told us that too, didn't he? He said that himself. You see, let me bring this one, God's comfort in ministry. Let me bring this to an end for you here by saying this. God's comfort in the ministry of Christ is that the veil has been, has been removed. And we, the church, we have beheld the full glory of the new covenant. And we can see and be witness that it is never fading It's never ending. 
it doesn't go away. It's permanent. It's eternal. And we're going to see that, 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 that this idea of the temporary versus the permanent throughout Paul's uh, writing here in, in 2 Corinthians. This is a theme that, that, that we see coming out, the permanence of our salvation. In chapter 4, moving along, in chapter 4, Paul writes about God's comfort and the ministry of suffering for Christ. And make no mistake, suffering for Christ is ministry. And I want to take a break here from my notes, and I want to say this to you guys, that if you're suffering right now, if you're suffering from mental or physical in health, if you're suffering from any of those, if you turn those things and you allow God's glory to shine through, that is suffering for the ministry. That is suffering for Christ. And let me explain why. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verses 7 through 9 says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. This is a very, very powerful set of verses here. And there's actually a song written about it that, that, that uses these as, this verse as lyrics, and I love that song. It's a great song. But this is a very powerful set of verses here. Paul says that we have treasures in jars of clay. And again, this takes us back to the Old Testament. It reminds us, it's reminiscent of, of Gideon's 300. And the treasure that was inside the jars of clay was the light. And let me tell you this morning, church, that if we suffer for Christ, the comfort is that if they break these vessels, these jars of clay, then the light of God will be shown. In fact, dare I say that these vessels must be broken for the light of God to be shown. And so this morning, again, I say to you, if you are suffering from physical or mental in health, these vessels must be destroyed. Do not despair. These vessels must be destroyed and the glory of God will be shown through it. Don't be, worried if, don't be worried if you're afflicted because all that means is that you're pressed for room, but you're not crushed, meaning that, that there's still room to spare. Don't be perplexed. To be perplexed means that, that, that you're unable to find a way, but we are not driven to despair. God has not allowed us to be driven to despair. And when Paul says that we are persecuted, that means that we're pursued by our enemies. They're they're chasing after us, but we are not forsaken. We are not overpowered. We are not destroyed. The comfort, the comfort here is in knowing that the suffering, that suffering for the ministry does not, and and hear me when I say this, suffering for ministry does not mean that the ministry is defeated. Suffering for ministry is the proof of the success of it. Moving on to chapter 5, Paul writes about God's comfort in the ministry of martyrdom for Christ. And again, let's take this back to the Old Testament. Do you guys remember the tabernacle? The tabernacle? It was basically a tent that the Israelites would set up as a a temporary temple to worship God in. Its design and layout was basically to resemble what was in heaven. And the tabernacle was, was a temporary dwelling place for the presence of God. And it was intended to be torn down. And later on, the Israelites built a temple. It was a building which was intended to stand forever. 
and it also resembled what was in heaven. Both of these places, again, were intended for, they, they were meant to be places of worship. And the same is true for these, the same is true now for these bodies that we are in. These are temporary dwelling places intended to be torn down, as I mentioned before. But our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven is preparing for us bodies of perfection, much like, much like the temple that Solomon built. These bodies are meant to be permanent, these bodies that he's preparing for us. And Paul makes reference to these bodies being temporary. And and what we have to look forward to in these permanent bodies, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. The comfort that God gives us in martyrdom for Christ, once again, is that these temporary dwellings, are intended, they are intended to be torn down. Just as the tabernacle was intended to be torn down, but our Father in heaven has prepared for us bodies of perfection, built to last for all of eternity, just like the new covenant, just like the temple was intended to be permanent. It was, dis- it was, it was supposed to be a forever thing. Of course, the sin of Israel made that not happen, but the point is that it was intended for that. Moving on to chapter 6, Paul writes about God's comfort in all circumstances of the ministry. Verses 4 through 7, Paul lists out 19 trying experiences of the ministry. Anyone who's ever been involved in ministry, these are things that you have tried with. These are things that you have strived with or things that you have strived for. And he says, But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, but by great endurance... In affliction, in hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, and by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. And again, these are trying experiences because these are things that we strive with and things that we strive for. So they're trying experiences for that reason. But in verses 8 through 10, Paul lists nine contrasts to these trying experiences. And this is what he says in chapter 6, verse 8. He says, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. Verse 9, as unknown and yet well-known. As dying, and behold, we live. As punished, yet we are not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. The comfort, the comfort of God in all circumstances of ministry is that while we strive to overcome the world, God has made us honorable. He has made us honorable. He has made us true. He has made us well known. He has made us living. He has given us reason to rejoice. He has made us rich. And He has given us everything to possess. You guys remember last week what I said is that the universe is for the church, the church is for the Redeemer, and the Redeemer is for God. He has given us everything to possess because all things belong to Him. And the seventh and final way God comforts us, well, Paul Paul, Paul points out here how God has comforted him in his heart. Paul speaks to his personal comfort from God, which really is true for all believers. There's a lot that we can draw from this. Let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul writes, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. 
And what Paul's writing about here in this seventh chapter of 2 Corinthians is he's writing about God's comfort in his relationship to the Corinthians. They had godly grief for their sin. And it re produced repentance. Which means, I don't know if you guys know this, but, but repentance means to change direction due to a recognition of misdirection. They realized they were going the wrong way and they turned around and went in the opposite direction. This godly grief that the Corinthians had led to salvation. Whereas if they would have just had worldly grief, it would have led to, what does Paul say here? Death. It would have led to death. And that's the comfort that God gives in Christian living. And it, again, it seems that this letter from Paul to the Corinthians showing their repentance from sin due to their godly grief shows us that the condition of the ministry in Corinth was on the mend. It was, it was, things were getting better. And again, I think that hearing this, hearing of the Corinthians' repentance and, and their mending of relationships, it brought Paul great joy. And can I be real with you guys for a second? That, that, and I know I can speak for Pastor Dennis when I say this, that when I say when we see you guys mending your relationships, it brings us overwhelming joy. It really, truly does. When we see that there's, that there's any kind of strife, like I mentioned last week, whether it's in relationships here or whether it's in relationships with our spouses or other various relationships, when we see these things on the men, when we see these things being fixed, it brings overwhelming joy. On the other side of that, when we don't see reconciliation of relationships, it also brings us great sorrow. It breaks our hearts. So the second area of ministry that Paul addresses with the Corinthians is that of Christian giving. Christian giving. And, you know, as Pastor Dennis always says, we don't bring up money unless the text brings it up. Unless we're reading through somewhere in Scripture and it comes up in the text. And, and not only that, but we'll never beg you for money either. There's no reason to. God is the God of, pro of, of providing. But with that said, here's why. Here's some reasons why we'll never beg you for money. Number one, God wants the person before he wants their worship. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7 says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, on their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves, what, first to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that he had started... That as, that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. You see, something that we have to understand is that giving, giving is a severe test of affliction. And affliction is a test of trust. And Paul says that the churches of Macedonia, when put to a severe test of trust, gave generously even in their poverty. But he also says that they gave according to their means. 
And Dennis and I and the rest of the leadership at New Hope will never ask you to do anything other than that. As Paul said, some gave what they were able to by their own accord, he says. It was unprovoked. They decided without influence of anyone else. And some decided from that same influence, from, from without, the, without influence, to give more than they could. But the key here is in verse 5. He says, they gave themselves what? First to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. First to the Lord and then to each other. Reason two that we will never beg for money is uh, we don't want you to give grudgingly. We want you to give joyfully. This is a pretty famous uh, passage here, Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse seven. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We don't want you to give because you feel like you have to, because you feel pressured into it. We want you to give because you want to. And which leads me into my next point here, and and my third and final point is that God gives us the grace to give. God gives us the grace to give. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, I'll repeat it. It says, Paul Paul writes, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. You see, giving, giving is a grace from God. And these Macedonians gave to a specific cause. That was the relief of the saints, Paul says. They gave to support the apostles, the missions trips, their pastors, and their other brothers and sisters who had need. But the key here in this one is that they did so by the grace of God. And here's the truth. There are no New Testament biblical rules to giving. Only simply principles for Christian giving. Not rules, but just principles to remember. One of which is to be a cheerful giver, not a reluctant one. The tithe is not demanded in the New Testament because we are now under the law of grace and therefore giving is done by grace according to your means. Now, in giving, I want you guys to remember this. I want you guys to remember this, that Christ didn't give a tenth. Christ gave all. He gave all. He sacrificed his life, and he gave all, not just a tenth. The third and final area of ministry that Paul wants the Corinthians to work on And he really wants them to work on this is Christian guarding. Christian guarding. You like that, Dennis? Yeah. Not only do I have the three C's, but I also have some rhyming in there too. Living, giving, guarding. Yeah. You got it. Christian guarding. And as we learned both last week and this week, the church in Corinth struggled with their ability to have good discernment. First, they allowed the disunity and immorality to creep into their worship of God. Then, they allowed these false apostles to come in. They lacked the ability to guard against the desires of their flesh. And that they allowed the disunity and immorality into the church. Instead of combating these desires of flesh, they gave in to the desires of flesh. 2 Corinthians 10 3-4 3-4 through four says, For though we walk in flesh, we are not waging war according to flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. 
We have to be very careful, church. We have to be very careful not to take the fight against our fleshly desires on with our strength. Not using worldly tools. But we need to use the tools that God has given us in this fight. And he's given us three tools. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And he's given us prayer. And listen, we need to be in the word of God constantly. We need to develop the good habits of Christian living. One of which is getting into the routine of reading God's word. And yes, make no mistake, right? The Holy Spirit will give you the things to say when the time comes to combat the world. But, however, that does not authorize the neglect of the Word. And being in it constantly. And as I just said, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will give you things to say when the, and, the, and the actions to take when the time is right. And so we should not only rely on God's Word, but we should rely on the Holy Spirit. We should rely on the guiding of the Holy Spirit and lean on the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that we lean on to gain understanding of God's Word anyway. And the hard part about this one is listening to the Holy Spirit, and acting upon the Spirit's, uh, the Spirit's leading. Not just ignoring it. And finally, we need to be in constant prayer. We need to be in communication with God on a regular basis. That's another part of becoming a mature Christian, is developing a habit of prayer. And while these, you know, the spontaneous times of prayer, while those things are good, we, I, I would encourage you all to devote, take the time out of your day and say, no, this block of time right here is for me and God. This block of time right here is for prayer. And take the time out of your day to talk to your Heavenly Father. These three tools will not only help you combat the desires of your heart, but they will also help you to guard against things like false teachers. Had the Corinthians been in the Word of God, they would have known better than to have listened to these false teachers. Had they relied on the Holy Spirit, they would, have, they would have been given discernment. Had they used these weapons, like prayer, they could have sought the wisdom of their Heavenly Father. They would have denied themselves, and they would have denied these false teachers. And Paul ends, he ends this second letter to the church at Corinth by writing this in chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice. What instruction does he give them? Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. There's that word again. Agree with one another. another, Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And after it's all said and done, that's my message to you guys. That's my message to you. Aim for restoration in all of your relationships, even the hardest of relationships. Aim for restoration. Don't make it a side note. Aim for it. When things start getting tough, Make, the, make, make it a desire in your heart to want the outcome to be restoration. Aim for it. Comfort one another in times of affliction as God comforts us. And live in peace with one another. 
That sums up Paul's entire relationship with the Corinthians. The story of his relationship with these guys. It's one of restoration. It's one of comfort. And ultimately, it's one where they can finally come together and live at peace with one another and no longer be quarreling with each other. That's the whole point of this. So with that said, that's my message to you. That's my message to you. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. Father, you are so good. And Lord, our desire, make our desire if this isn't it, Lord, to be restored to each other. Make our desire to comfort one another, Lord. Give us the desire to live at peace with one another. Lord, this resembles everything that you've done for us. You were the one who took the first step to restoring the relationship. You were the one who gave comfort. And it's because of you, because of that restoration and that comfort, that we now live at perfect harmony in peace with the God of our salvation, with the God of our creation. And so, Lord, as we grow to be more and more like you, help us to, to, to reflect this better and better, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would put a desire to be in constant prayer, Lord, to give us a desire to, be, uh, to rely on your Holy Spirit and to be in your word. And Lord, never let us forget the, all the ways that you comfort us. Lord, let us not forget that these bodies are temporary dwellings. Help us not to cling to these bodies too tightly, Lord, because their intent is to be destroyed. These dwelling places must be destroyed. But Father, we look beyond the destruction of these bodies and we look toward the perfection that, that awaits us, the glory beyond our understanding that awaits us. Lord, help us to give generously. Not just of our money, Lord, but of our time, Lord. Let us give ourselves to each other, Father, and not be our own. You are a good and you are a just God, and we love you. And I ask for every person in this, in this room this morning, Lord, and in your church all over the world, Father, that as we go and start our new week, that you would bless us, Lord, that you would keep us, Father. Keep us from harm. Keep us from sickness and in health, Lord. And again, Father, keep us constantly in your word and in your prayer and in total reliance on your spirit, Father. We love you. And we praise you and we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We have the opportunity this morning take the Lord's Supper together. Pastor Jesse spoke well on 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And as part of that, he reminds us of what the Lord's Supper is all about, what communion is all about. We're, uh, we're celebrating something that Jesus himself instituted just before his death and what is it that we're celebrating when we when we take the the bread uh, and the grape juice what are we celebrating well we're celebrating really three things through the giving of his body and through the giving of his blood we're celebrating the freedom that he gave us from sin 
the freedom from sin, which, of course, culminates in our salvation. So it's a rejoicing. Secondly, we celebrate the union and the unity and the peace that we have with God because of what Jesus did. And thirdly, we celebrate the peace and the union and the unity that we share with one another because of what Jesus did for us. In 1 Corinthians, it speaks of our unity with one another and how we should treat one another and and the attitude and the mindset with which we approach the Lord's Supper. Pastor Jesse pointed out last week that God does not desire that we should come to him in worship if we have disunity with one another. That's a sobering reminder. 1 Corinthians 11.29, for if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and sick. Some have died. This is a really, really sobering thought. I don't know if you've thought much about this when you take the Lord's Supper, but as we're about to partake, I want you to think and and meditate on one thing um, that is so critical. Your relationships, our relationships with one another are on the top of God's priority list. And if you have something against a brother and sister or sister that you have not done anything everything in your power to be at peace with them please make it right if your heart is not right before God because it's not right with someone else please don't partake of this it's not what we're saying it's what God is saying and so we ask you to make those things right this morning we're gonna we're gonna take the the bread and the juice that represents God's body and his blood that Christ shed for us. We here at New Hope celebrate communion in a way that uh, we call it open communion where we invite everyone to come. I don't care who you are. I don't care what church you come from, whether you go to church somewhere else or you're a part of a different congregation or, or whatever. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come with us. And to participate with us joyfully, but also soberly. So here's how this is going to work. We've got the elements up here. I would uh, like to uh, invite the center aisles first to come down, uh, grab the elements, and then go back to your seats. Let's go ahead and stand right now. uh, Center aisle. Come down, grab uh, the element and elements and take them back to your seats and then following them we'll do the outer aisles
you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the opportunity to come before you, to remember, to celebrate, to commemorate what you and you alone have done to secure our salvation. Lord, we do not take this lightly. And we ask you to help us in our minds and our spirits do this in a manner that pleases you, that fulfills the purpose for which you intended this celebration. Lord, we ask you to make our hearts right toward one another. Lord, if we have anything against one another, we ask that those things would be completely forgiven. That we would stand right before you and before each other because you have forgiven. We can forgive. And Father, now as we as we take these elements, Lord, We do so reverently. We do so soberly. We do so humbly. And we do so very, very gratefully, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Dear Lord, we are in awe at the price you were willing to pay for our salvation. And Lord, because of that, it is not too much for you to ask us for anything. And so, Lord, even as you ask us to offer to you our bodies as living sacrifices, so we do willingly. And even as you ask us to be at utter peace and at unity with one another, so we do willingly. Because you loved us first, so we love. Father, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you for these elements that remind us of who we are and what you've done for us. Help us to live with these things in mind. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Return in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. So praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Praise the name. 
endless days can start right now. Father, we thank you so much for giving us this place and this time where we can open your word and receive the elements and think about all that you've done for us. And we thank you for the hope that we have in you from the very moment we pray that simple prayer to say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I invite you into my heart and I make you my Lord and Savior. And we thank you for the eternal life that we have in you, not by anything that we've done, but by everything that was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you that it makes us whole, makes us new creations. And something we can rejoice in. So God, as we face the rest of this weekend and the week ahead, as always, we ask for your blessings over our families, our workplaces, our circles of influence. We ask that you bless us and keep us, make your face shine upon us, be gracious unto us, and lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace and comfort, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's awesome worship with you guys. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you back here next Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you.